Okay, so next up we have John Seymour from Zero Fox. So put your hands together for John. And we're good. Awesome. Cool. So today I'll be talking about labeling the virus share data set and indexing it so that people can actually use it for machine learning and things like that. Um, before I start, I just kind of want to get a feel for people here. How many people are like in the data science side of InfoSec, you know? Okay. And how many like reverse engineers or malware analysts or anything like that? Do we have some? Okay, cool. I would love to speak with you guys after this talk. So feel free to come on up. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, my name is John Seymour. Um, here's my UMBC email because this is part of my PhD work. And uh, my Twitter handle's here. Follow me. I'll tweet out some links after the talk. You can download some cool stuff. So who am I? Well, um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I'm also a data scientist at ZeroFox, and I do a lot of security machine learning work. Uh, my interests are mainly in like data sets and proving that they don't suck and can actually be used for gaining information on what we're building machine learning models on. So we'll start today by talking just basically introduction for some of you on the security side of things, like a very, very high level description of malware classification in general, what works, what doesn't. Um, then we'll segue into labeling the virus share corpus, why that's good, how it helps. Um, building an index, why we need an index in the first place, uh, what that means, uh, using a cool sexy tool that I wanted to learn about called PySpark, and we'll end up with some pretty graphs and words of caution and some useful extensions for these things. So the main problem here is there's more malware variants created every day than we can possibly ever analyze, right? There's this thing called polymorphic malware, which basically means you run the malware and it changes its, you know, SHA-256, you know, hash or whatever signatures that are being used to classify these things, right? Um, so we want to automate this process. And how do we automate it? Well, one thought is maybe we can apply machine learning to it. So what is machine learning? Well, at a high level, it's finding patterns in data, right? You have all this data, you want to find patterns in it, so you can maybe say, hey, it's likely this thing is, you know, malicious, maybe we should check it out, or maybe this thing is obviously, you know, standard procedure, we don't need to look at it at all, right? Um, and what we call these sort of patterns that we're looking at, we call them features. Um, and we use models, which uh, are statistical things, just to make sense of these features. And there are, of course, libraries in every programming language you want to use. Uh, I love Python. I know a lot of people like R and Weka. We just saw a talk with Weka. Um, and here are two links that I love for you know just getting started on the data science side of things. Um, yeah. So cool. If we want to do data science, we have to have data to actually work with, right? And so where do we find data in the malware domain? Um, here's some of the best places that I've found for malware. Um, I know there are lots of others, Contagio, Malshare, things like that. Um, these are the things that I've found to be used most, you know, in, in the industry, in academia, things, um, all of them. Um, so the first place uh, I love is malwaretrafficanalysis.net. Um, it's only got about 600 samples, so it's not very useful for, like, full-scale, you know, productionized machine learning, right? Um, but the, it, it's got a couple really good points to it. Um, first, there's lots of exploit kits in it. And exploit kits were, you know, all the rage like a year ago or something like that. And uh, it includes the analyses for every single sample. So there's this guy who actually goes through, you know, writes up, you know, uh, takes a PCAP, takes the executable, uploads its fire share, tells how he reverse engineered this uh, executable. And he actually writes it all down so you can go back and read it and learn actually how to do all this reverse engineering stuff, which is very useful when you're cr creating models because you actually need a little bit of domain expertise to know like what's going on, what's, you know, 192.0.0.1 you know, or whatever is uh, uh, totally fine, don't worry about things that call out to it, things like that. Um, so, so you can get a little bit of domain expertise. Then there's the Kaggle data set. For those of you who don't know, Kaggle is a data science competition hosting site. And last year, Microsoft hosted a competition on Kaggle for classifying malware. Um, I'll get into that in a bit, 
but they released about 11,000 samples of malware. They neutered them a bit, um, and, which is 500 gigabytes on your hard drive, can fit pretty well. Um, and the task was to say, hey, here are these nine families of malware. Figure out which executables um, in this test set that we don't know uh, belong to which families. And uh, how they distributed this data was they gave hex dumps and disassembled files from Ida Pro um, that they removed all the PE headers from so nobody could actually execute the files. But uh, basically, um, people use you know, standard natural language processing techniques and stuff like that in order to actually fulfill the competition. The next data set that I'd like to talk about is VX Heaven. Um, so VX Heaven has about an order of magnitude more samples than Kaggle actually had. Um, each file in uh, VX Heaven is actually named with Kaspersky's antivirus label. So for example, if Kaspersky labeled it a Trojan or something like that, then it'll have Trojan and, and the hash and stuff like that in the file name. And it's really nice because it's really well organized, but it was last updated in 2007, which if you know malware, uh, things have changed a little bit since XP was still alive. And uh, yeah, so it's pretty stale. Um, but it is the most used academic data set, so it's nice to know about. <clears throat> what we'll be talking about today is Vireshare. Um, it has, I think it's increased in size actually since I made this slide, but it has about 25 million samples, which is quite a bit. Um, it's split into chunks, and this is actually kind of important, I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, but it's split into chunks of 65,536 samples each. So basically chunk zero has the first 65,536 files that this guy found, then chunk one has the next 65,536 files, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this actually ends up being pretty useful, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all the malware is available by torrent. It's a simple password to get into. Um, the guy is awesome. You know, he didn't pay me anything to give this talk, but um, I like him a lot. And uh, the main issue with this data set, though, is that it was unlabeled. So as the last talk talked about, ground truth is really, really important when you're doing machine learning, but it's also the most expensive part of it. It's really, really hard to do. And so what we've actually done today is label this corpus. And then I also want to shout out to VirusTotal and Maltrieve, which both have methods for collecting malware um, as well. Um, they, you know, there's no limit to how many pieces of malware that you can grab from them. There's a couple issues with both of those. Um, first, VirusTotal, generally you need the private API in order to do useful things with it, um, such as you know, download malware. And uh, there's, there's a lot of, A, it's really, really freaking expensive, but B, there are these licensing issues where you're not actually allowed to release raw data that you obtain from the platform. And my research is into like reproducibility of ML you know, experiments and things like that. So it'd be nice to have an open data set that we can work with that bench, you know, we can benchmark all our machine learning tools on and stuff like that. So VirusTotal ends up, I think, probably being the wrong way to go in terms of actually obtaining your data set. Um, it is still really nice for their labeling and things like that. And if the licensing issues, you know, change, obviously. And then uh, Maltrieve as well. Um, basically, there's this crawler that goes around, downloads all the malware you want. Um, but what I've found in my own research is that when people collect their own data sets in that sort of fashion, they end up overfitting pretty bad. Um, there was a, a study in 2012 from, that actually went to Black Hat um, that Adobe made. And uh, basically, <laughs> They said, hey, we have these nine features, we can classify malware with them with 98% accuracy, and it turned out that it was just um, overfitting to Microsoft-specific coding standards, so anything that wasn't written by Microsoft ended up being labeled as malware. Um, these are things we want to avoid, and this is how we do it. So some of the features that are commonly used uh, in, in this domain, um, there's P file metadata, which is basically things inside your uh, executable that tell Windows, hey, this is how you run uh, this executable, this is how it, it should actually you know, be interpreted by the machine. And uh, I'm not gonna get too deep into it, uh, but there are headers and sections, and people use these to grab features from, there's, you know, it's rich with data. And there's a very good uh, Python, uh, sorry, Python library called PE file, which is excellent for actually scraping all this from your executables. Another feature that's really commonly used in this domain are n-grams. 
So uh, n-grams are just, if you think about like a sliding window over text, um, every two byte sequence in the executable, um, you just count those up and use that as features. So for example, in dead beef, uh, D-E-A-D, A-D-B-E, and B-E-E-F are all two byte n-grams. And so your features would be those three n-grams with a count of one each. Um, this is actually mainly what was used during the Kaggle competition since they had stripped all the useful information out of the files. I did. Did you? What was your outrageous speaker request? Uh, no brown M&Ms? No green M&Ms. No, no green M&Ms. Oh, all right, whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, cool. Awesome. Um, so some other features that are commonly used. Um, Opcodes, imports, you know, assembly instructions, things like that. People are just trying to find data everywhere in these executables. Um, if you'd like to learn more, you know, there's a, a lot of references. Come talk to me after the talk. And then finally, some of the top performing models in this domain. Um, support vector machines are kind of old school at this point, um, but a lot of people like to use them. They're robust against overfitting in certain ways, and they're nice. Um, there's this new thing called XGBoost, Extreme Gradient Decision Tree Boosting. Um, it pretty much kills everything. Uh, if you know random forest or decision trees, think of XGBoost as a uh, random forest on super, super steroids. Um, and then finally, deep learning is a cool hot topic that people are starting to use in this domain too. Um, there are libraries in Python for all of these. I can't speak for Weka or R. <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about labeling the virus share corpus and what in, went into this. Um, so my motivation was there's this Kaggle competition and I'm trying to see if the models in this Kaggle competition overfit. And so what I need to do is I need to find in some disparate data set a lot more of the families that were in the Kaggle competition. So we have like things like this label, Ramnet. We want to be able to find lots more examples of Ramnet somewhere else so that we can run the models that were built in the Kaggle competition on these other, uh, other executables that we find. And so what we've done, well, first, we labeled this huge corpus using VirusTotal so that we can actually, you know, uh, use it for supervised learning, things like that, but also so that we can create a search index on top of it so that we can find lots of a particular type of malware. And this could actually be useful for not only machine learning, but I think it might be useful for pen testing and reverse engineering practice as well. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I'd like to talk to you guys after the talk. So why did I choose Vireshare uh, instead of one of the other, you know, corpora that's out there for malware? Well, first off, obviously the size. It's huge, 27 million samples. Uh, that's, you know, several, several orders of magnitude bigger than the Kaggle data set size. And furthermore, it's just the raw executables, so it's not neutered at all. Um, it's consistently updated. Um, as I've said, like, there's 20 more chunks uh, since I actually started putting these slides together of Vireshare uh, malware that, um, are already up there, so we can, we can you know, consistently update um, the data set. But uh, really, what I want to do here is make future uh, machine learning research more reproducible, right? So I already talked about if you scrape your own, you'll probably overfit and you'll end up with one of those titanic level disasters that was in the keynote. But uh, um, virus total, you can't release any raw data from the platform. And that, as, as a data science paper writer, that sucks for me because I normally have a methodology section in my papers and I need to say like, where I got my data from. And it's really hard to actually like, download a data set from another you know, academic paper or industry paper for machine learning because it's all secret sauce. Um, this is actually really nice because since Fireshare is split into chunks, I can just say, look, I downloaded all the Ramnet executables from chunks 25, 60, and 90, and that was the data set I used for my machine learning corpus here. And so it's really, really easy to actually reproduce the machine learning models that other people uh, make, and it, it eliminates a lot of the like, stochast uh, stochasticity that's just inherent in the machine learning process. And so if we actually like, start to you know, reproduce machine learning research, we can actually figure out, hey, you know, this machine learning model works, or this machine learning model doesn't work in this you know, other domain that I tried, right? So uh, we chose VirusTotal to label the executables, right? Um, obviously, because VirusTotal is one of the, you know, the leading vendor in the space. 
but uh, also it has an awesome API. So we can just do this programmatically. We don't need to pay lots of malware analysts to you know, go through every single executable in the virus share corpus and say, hey, I think this is Vundo, or I think this is Ramnet, or I think this is Conficker, or some variant of ransomware that we don't know about, or whatever. Um, so VirusTotal has two different types of APIs. It has a private and research API and a public API. And the difference is that the public API is rate limited, but the private research API either costs money or has these licensing agreements where you can't release raw data from the platform. And so if, if we labeled using the private API, then we couldn't actually distribute our results you know, to the public and other people actually use them, right? So we ended up using the, the public API. And uh, actually, this is all the code to um, take in a, a batch of executables and label it using the virus total API. I'm gonna wait, okay, cool. And so this is actually what you get back, right? And so um, I've just formatted it prettily. This is just one line of JSON. Um, but you basically get back each different antivirus and what that antivirus detected the executable as. So these are basically going to be the labels that we have for ground truth with working with this, uh, with this corpus. And uh, so generally antivirus labels are pretty inconsistent, but this is definitely in a step from the right direction. All right, so using the public, uh, public API, it actually took 30 people and uh, around six months to label the entire corpus uh, because of rate limiting. Um, we we uh, used a lot of undergraduates wanting extra credit from UMBC, which was nice. Um, also, uh, some people from the MLSEC project uh, actually helped out and beta tested the tools and stuff like that, so that was really cool too. Um, this is actually all the labels from chunk 0 to 233, I think. Um, again, there have been more since then. I'll release those after DEF CON when I actually get access to Wi-Fi again. But um, basically, it's, I think it's 7 gigs compressed of just those lines that you saw earlier. Um, and it's you know, really easy to look at, really easy to find things. But, uh, but what we want right is we want this tool that we can go through and say, hey, look, um, we want to find lots of Ramnet instances, right? And what we have right now is we have this thing that says, hey, in chunk zero, we have uh, you know, win32 HFS adware dot 166 or whatever. Uh, we got some pups, things like that, right? Um, what we really want is something that we can just go through and say, okay, like, we have this type of label that we're looking for. How many are in each chunk? And this actually makes it a lot easier to search over this data set, right? Um, if we want to you know, only find malware in chunks 4, 60, and 90, what we do is we just say, hey, like, um, grep through it and be like, what's the count in chunks 4, 60, and 90? <clears throat> so this is called an inverted index. And the way you do it is basically by counting things, right? And apparently, I've heard the MapReduce framework is awesome for this. Um, Actually, the PySpark initial tutorial is exactly this problem. So it works out pretty well, especially since I wanted to learn PySpark. And this ends up actually being the entire script, which is really, really nice. Um, so it's like, what, 20 lines of code. Everything else is just formatting. And it's really easy to you know, like learn and use. And it's actually more work to install PySpark than to actually use it, which is pretty cool. And this is what the inverted index actually looks like after we finish, right? So you can sort of see um, here's, it's a CSV with the label, how many are in 000, 001, et cetera. And it ends up being really easy to use. You can just grep for Vundo. You get all the results for Vundo. This is how many in each you know, chunk. And you can even see by inspection, look, those chunks have a lot of Vundo. Um, we should, if we want Vundo, we should download those chunks, right? And then it also, this index also lets us easily explore this data. Um, so I really quick in like two minutes threw up um, basically most frequent malware in the last recent chunks. And uh, yeah, you can see that there's about like a thousand of Riskware, Adware, Screensaver, you know, Win32, Eldorados. Um, you, you can find that out in like less than two minutes, which is pretty nice. And you can also make a lot of pretty graphs, which is nice too. Um, so this is 
one of the cool things with Vireshare is he actually posts each chunk uh, temporally, right? So he posts chunk zero first, chunk one second, chunk third, you know, third, et cetera. Um, so this means we can actually use the chunk number as a proxy for time, and we can see how many you know instances of Vundo this guy collected, um, you know, in kind of over time. And uh, so this is uh, this is just a graph again made in like less than two minutes of how many instances of Win32 Vundo this guy collected, and you can see like there's a spike there and there's a you know dip here. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about this sort of temporal, uh, you know, um, plotting, right? Like, for example, a that the chunks are, you know, um, sort of a good proxy for the time period, but b that the number of instances this guy collected is um, actually like proportional to how many are floating around or something like that. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely like as long as you're aware of those assumptions and things like that, um, it, it's useful. And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, maybe how to fix those things in a second. Um, so some words of warning. Um, first off, don't use this to compare antiviruses. Um, so that's one thing that uh, I definitely want to say just to try to get VirusTotal maybe off my back for this. Um, so they have a big disclaimer on their site. Um, and there's a couple reasons that I've thought of why this might be. And I think the main one is if you've ever actually submitted data back to VirusTotal saying like this is malicious or this is the file, uh, the antiviruses choose to do that different ways. Um, one is you can actually basically give your product to VirusTotal and say hey run it whenever you run into something new. But the main way that most people use is if they encounter something in the wild, they wild, they send it back to VirusTotal with the correct label. So this ends up actually meaning a lot of vendors run into sort of different sections of malware, if that makes sense. And so, for example, at a social media company, you might find links on social media that, you know, Kaspersky might not or something like that. Um, another thing that you want to keep in mind when using this sort of index or data, um, ground truth is very, very noisy in this. Um, first off, we've already seen that the antivirus labels are sometimes different, even though the specimens are similar, just with that Vundo uh, uh, index here, right? All of these are part of the Vundo family, but um, they get labeled, you know, as soon as the signature for Vundo.a uh, no longer works, then they increment it, and now Vundo.b um, is, you know, a, a new specimen, even though it's a very similar one. Um, but also, antivirus labels are sometimes similar, even when the specimens are different. So, like, here's an example of that, right? Um, here's a lot of different Trojans, and I have absolutely no idea whether those are actually similar executables or not, based on the name, right? Um, so, like, heuristic dot looks like Trojan is, I don't know, maybe a Trojan is basically what that label is telling you, right? So, so some useful extensions here. Um, one thing is, remember that graph where we used the uh, chunk number as a proxy for time. Um, if, if we wanted to do that right, what we'd want to do is add when the specimen was first seen, rather than you know, just how many this guy collected over time. And uh, that's only available on the private research API, so it wouldn't be able to release to the public if we did that. Um, so definitely, maybe find a way to do this. Uh, that might be nice. But uh, the other major useful extension that I can see from this is some sort of stemming. So stemming and lemmatization in machine learning is basically like a way of compressing um, words that have similar roots together, right? So that you know, generic dot vundo dot a and generic dot vundo dot b. We'd like them to both be called one label vundo. Um, but that actually ends up having some issues, um, especially when you have things like, you know, um, Trojan.ABCDEFG and Trojan.ABCDEFG, you know, H or something like that. It ends up actually being compressed on the, the actual incremented counter, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, if, if we could somehow compress those labels, that might help with the antivirus labels being different, even though the specimens are similar problem. 
um, which, which would be really, really nice. Um, and then finally, antivirus labeling is, is very inconsistent. So this would actually help us get higher granularity on our ground truth labels. Um, so I know I blazed through that, but uh, if there are any questions, feel free to step up to the mic. Seen the CVE models? Um, so I have not yet. Uh, that would definitely be a cool uh, extension. Um, I would love to do that. What? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I would definitely, definitely like to look into that too. Any other questions? So, um, with the names, uh, did you consider kind of splitting the names at the breaks and analyzing that way, since most of these are divided by either a period or a slash or something? So I what could do that, like most of the ways I've tried to split naively so far, um, I, I've run into issues where like there's all these exceptions that don't fit the mold, um, kind of like, you know, the malware classification problem in general, but, uh, and, and there's just not enough time in the day to actually go through and fix all those exceptions. Um, so I'm actually looking for maybe some sort of statistical technique that might help. What a, also, so one of the things I've tried and maybe you've tried and gotten better is looking at the multiple names for the same malware and building the relationship graph between the names and then trying to kind of get clusters of these names are all generally the same piece of malware, mm -hmm. you know, and there'll be overlap and things like that, but kind of try to use that to group names into a more, into a way that helps you get over the, you know, one, two, three, four, five problem. Yeah, so um, that's actually the approach that I'm thinking I'm going to take in the next few months. Um, it, it, I think it's probably the best way to go, but it ends up being really, like, expensive for me. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna try it and see how it works out and maybe see. How did you handle the cases where virus total labeled things as two different virus families or multiple virus families? That don't share similar code bases. Right, so right now, um, I release the labels with all of the different, like, it, it's literally this, uh, shoo, 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 this uh, LDJSON. Um, so you can actually, like, build the index even on a single antivirus or something like that. I haven't really found a good solution for that actual problem yet. Again, like, antivirus labels are very, very freaking noisy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm open to suggestions there, actually, is what I can say. Right now, I've built the index with all of them because my major use case is just, like, finding lots of Vundo malware. And so if, uh, if I actually, um, you know, find a chunk that's not exactly the optimal chunk because two different antivirus li uh, vendors labeled it differently, uh, it, it's not majorly a problem for me. Have you considered taking the data and running it through uh, like a relational database as well to see where other clusters might r exist that don't like readily come to the surface? Yeah, that would be a really cool idea. Um, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, so um, it's a little further in like sort of the labeling process than I, I intended to go, but it's sounding like I probably should. Um, but yeah, no, actually, that's a really good idea. And have you used something like a freak.py that does like language frequency as well on the names that it's, that it's giving back to you to see if that provides any sort of analytics? So um, I have tried like counting, you know, different labels, different um, like substrings within the labels and things like that. Um, I, I just still get into the issue where there's all these exceptions where like, again, Trojan.abcdefg, like abcdefg ends up being the string that occurs more frequently, like not in that exact example. But uh, so with all these exceptions, it, it would actually, I would have to use Amazon's mechanical chart or something to get rid of them. Um, but yeah. Um, would you mind sharing how you did Microsoft Cago last year? Um, so, Martin tried very hard, <laughs> but we are only the 44th. 
So I actually, I did not spend much time on it at all. I actually had a few friends. In fact, Gabe, were you on my team? Yeah. <laughs> so, in, in only the most technical sense, because like we got on it and then it became DBIR season and my, my availability time went there. Yeah, exactly. And I was like presenting my master's to, uh, actual project yeah. and stuff like that. So it, it ended up, we didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't try as hard as I, you know. Yeah. If it came out again, maybe. <laughs> cool. Is that all the questions? Anybody else? All right. Again, I'd like to talk to malware analysts and reverse engineers up front or you know, outside or something. We'll figure out a space. Um, but thank you for having me.